live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we're going to be talking with some people from Friends of Guest House in Alexandria. This program works with women who are formerly incarcerated and walks them through a supportive six month program now, just got expanded to six month, that helps women re enter our community. Joining me in this segment is Laura Jessick. Thank you, Laura, for being here. Thank you. And one of the things that we were talking about before the show is the huge number of women being incarcerated. There has been a dramatic increase in the number of women in both jails and prisons yeah. since 1970, which creates this problem of once these women are incarcerated, then these huge numbers of women are being put back out into their communities with basically little to no support, which is where Guest House comes in. Yes. So you've been doing this since 1974. Yeah, um, Guest House was founded um, back in 1974 by a woman who was released in Northern Virginia, and she had no, no support or anything, but she was able to um, secure a house in Alexandria, and she got the support of Old Presbyterian Meeting House um, to help her finance it. So she opened the doors to other women being released from the community, and ever since, th being released from incarceration. And ever since then, it's been, our doors have been open. So the numbers are pretty staggering. Since 1974, even 17, because you just increased in 2014 from 17 beds to 26 beds. Correct. So up to that point, you're doing it 17 women at a time yes. for decades, but you've helped over 3,000 women and importantly, their 4,000 children. Yes. So talk a little bit about the fact that, you know, an important part of, of women reentering their community is also reconnecting with their families. Mm. So most of our women have children and they age, their age ranges from like one to maybe in their 30s or 40s. And what's really interesting is those with older children, they come into the program and they talk about their relationships with their children and they're saying, I don't have a relationship with my children anymore because I haven't been able to get myself back on my feet. So it's really important that when somebody comes in and they have those younger children that we reconnect them um, because it helps them feel more confident in themselves, the women that is, and it also builds that relationship um, with the child. So it takes the burden off of other family members to take care of those children or the foster care system. Right. And so the recidivism rate is also remarkable in that 70 percent of women coming out of jail or prison end up going back in, in this terrible cycle of yes. just in and out. But with Guest House, your recidivism rate is less than 10%. Correct. And so tell us a little bit about some of the programs that, that help to keep that recidivism rate low. Yeah, so from, from when I first started, which was in 2014, we were basically just helping the women with securing employment by building their resume, having those job interviewing skill classes, um, and including what to wear to a job interview. Um, some of the women come down the steps saying they're going to a job interview in ripped jeans and a uh, tank top. and. You're kind of like, why? No, we need to fix that. So it's these basic skills that we're offering and um, how to follow up appropriately after a job interview to make yourself presentable. The other thing that's hard for these women with employment is to explain those gaps in their resumes because they have that incarceration time. So we have volunteers and other programming individuals who come in and have those conversations with the women. What's really great is that we just started a workforce development program. So um, the women are actually in classes about nine to five every day and with breaks for lunch and dinner and to meet with their case manager um, and so they get even more intensive um, class skills. So how do you choose the 26 women that I'm sure that there's a lot more than 26 people who apply to be yes. in your program. What does that process look like? Yeah, back in 2014, I think we had almost 400 applications, but we could only accept and help about 50 women. Um, so a couple of the automatic qualifications that you have to have to get into our program is being on Virginia state probation. So unfortunately, we get a lot of individuals who are on local probation applying for our program, but they're not eligible because we are a state-funded um, program. So they have to be on Virginia State. We also do not accept violent offenses. So these women mostly have petty larceny, some grand larceny, some drug charges, and probation violations. We don't see anything like sexual crimes or um, violent crimes in general. So um, a violent crime would automatically disqualify you. Once you've had um, your probation and your 
crimes are not violent, you can complete the application. And we basically discuss goals, support network, um, substance abuse, and clean time. And it's just, it's really hard to pick who gets to come because it feels almost like a... Yeah, the wisdom of Solomon, right? Yeah, you're offering... Everybody needs, everybody needs the services. Yeah, so it's really hard. I was very intrigued by the fact that you have youth groups that have actually become part of your application process by writing personal letters back to the applicants, which I think is amazing. Yeah, a lot of youth groups and uh, Boy Scout groups and Girl Scout groups, they like to volunteer with us. And they like to do things as simple as decorate the house with the women for Christmas. Um, and one thing we found really beneficial was these writings of letters to our are individuals that have applied to the program and their files just sitting there. Sometimes our individual individuals apply and they still have two years of incarceration. So they're not getting that communication with many people at all, especially if they don't have funds on their account to make phone calls. So the youth groups come in and they write colorful um, letters, just kind of like, hey, we look forward to you being here. We're thinking of you. Here's some great opportunities we'll have. You'll have when you're here and um, we just can't wait to have you. And uh, some of the response back from those individuals that have received those were just amazing. They felt truly happy to get a correspondence from somebody who expressed caring for them. And that's it, right? You're visible to somebody who cares. Mm -hmm. So when these women step off the bus or however they get, what do they have when they show up at, at Guest House? Nothing. Um, some individuals, it's really, they're lucky because they're from the area, so they have family that can come with things. But more often than not, sometimes the women are getting out of the um, car in shackles, their wrists and um, their ankles shackled, and they walk up to the door and they have nothing but paper belongings. Um, sometimes the first conversation I have with them is, okay, do you have pajamas to sleep in tonight? No. Do you have clean underwear? Just the ones I'm wearing. Um, it's those basic needs that they don't even have when they walk in the door. So this is something that in addition to raising funds to operate Guest House, you are also looking for donations. You, I know that you have like a target wish list mm -hmm. where people can go and buy things like socks and underwear and just the basic need, tooth, toothbrushes, toothpaste, yep. the things because they come with nothing. Yeah, we try and give each individual what I like to call an intake kit. Um, which um, for a while a youth group made little canvas bags and they decorated them on the front and then put a welcome card in. And then I, we would fill them with a bottle of shampoo, conditioner, and body wash, a washcloth, deodorant, all of the above. And then each individual would get this bag and they knew they could take a fresh shower as soon as they got in that night. Which is amazing. And so we were talking too about some of the problems with women. Some of them are coming from prison. Some of them are coming from jail. Mm -hmm. Jail tends to be less than a year. Yes. So some of these women, for instance, who have court ordered parenting classes that they're supposed mm -hmm. to take. Tell us about how that works out when you've been court ordered to have a parenting class. It doesn't work out very well. Um, since I've been there, I've had multiple people, whether they're court ordered or not, a lot of the women come in and they say they want a parenting class. and. Um, I only know of one parenting class in Northern Virginia, and it happens uh, biannually, um, so it's not happening very frequently, and it's harder to get the women in because it's in such high demand. And um, so we've actually brought in a volunteer to help with that, but um, she only has so much time on her hands. So that par the parenting classes, it's not, it's really hard to meet that demand for a court order and just to be a better mother. Right, and so. It's easy to see how frustrating it can be in, in inside, and we're going to talk with three residents of your program who are going to give us a fuller picture of what it's like to be incarcerated, whether in jail or in prison, but just the shortage of services that they need. Mm -hmm. So when they come out, then you are trying to pull up the slack, but you're doing this for 26 women. Mm -hmm. not the 450 who applied. Yes. So there's a book we were talking about called Becoming Mrs. Burton yeah. that was written. She gave, I uh, heard her interviewed on NPR. She gave a talk at Bus Boys yeah. and Poets. But basically the book Becoming Mrs. Burton is exactly about the experience of getting out of prison mm -hmm. and having to figure out how to make it on your own when you've got no resources. Why is the recidivism rate 70%? because there's no resources. Um, I know that if I were to be released from prison and I were to not have anywhere safe to go and I know I need food, I need clothes, I need some money to try and find a job, I'm gonna go back to what I know because in my mind, that's my best option instead of sleeping on the streets. Right, so women are just cycling through the, the prison system mm -hmm. and with very few resources and then we wonder why we have a problem. But this is becoming increasingly a problem for children. You yes. know, Nicholas Kristof wrote an article in November 2016 that estimates 
million children are affected by having a parent who is incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But unlike men with children, women who are incarcerated, the highest percentage of them are single parents. Yes. So a father might have children, but his children are with their mother. Yes. A woman is often the only parent. Mm -hmm. So how do you try to you know, help women when they come back out of prison to figure out ways in which they can reconnect with their families? It's really hard because oftentimes the women feel that they've, they've missed something. They don't even know where to start because they're recognizing that they missed a large portion of this child's life or teenager's life and um, they're not exactly sure where to start. So some guidance is always something that the case managers offer. We also offer like oftentimes picnics and things like that that family can come to so it's a group setting. Um, so the individual, the resident may not feel as pressured. Um, and then, um, you know, it's just about offering opportunities for classes to be held for the family as well. The family. Um, sometimes yeah. we have a volunteer that I believe is centered in Fairfax. She comes in and she does some classes for the women and their family um, so that they can have a conversation, an honest, open conversation about this is what I experienced. And then the mother can also say, this is what I experienced. And so are you continually looking for more volunteers or organizations that offer those kinds of services? Yes. We are always looking for those um, volunteers and organizations. Uh, the important part is that uh, often we're, we can't offer much fun financially. Right, for those so you're basically looking for other nonprofits to help you out. Yeah. Just real briefly, because we're winding up the segment, talk a little bit about forma, um, trauma informed care and what we know about the, the, the number of women who are going into the prison and jail system who were traumatized as a child. They're victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse as a child. Um, so they, they are entering the system with a lot of trauma that is triggered. So there's PTSD that's not really being mm -hmm. addressed. How much are you seeing about the acknowledgement that we need to do more trauma-informed care for these women? In the incarcerate, in the jails and prisons, we need to do a lot more um, because oftentimes these women get no privacy. Um, it comes down to, we had a conversation with another organization about some of the bathrooms are out in the open to change their feminine products. And these guards are male and female, and they can say um, degrading things. I've heard a lot of horror stories. And we need to be able to acknowledge that these treating the women like they're a problem and try, speaking down to them is only going to reinforce the recidivism rate because they have no encouragement. Absolutely, and this is, this is what I would hope that our viewers understand too. So please join us after this break. We're going to talk to some of the program residents at Friends of Guest House about what their experience has been while they were in jail or in prison to help us better understand what they bring when they come outside back into our communities and try to be successfully reintegrated into our community. So please join us after the break. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One of some bitches and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about Rick Dodd's life. Nothing very nice. But a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Yeah. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go? to protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh. 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 Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school, 
These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. Tonight we are talking about the experience of women behind PARS. And in these next three segments, we're gonna be talking to some of the women who have previously been incarcerated and are now part of the program at Friends of Guest House. In this segment, we are talking to Tristika Pressgraves. Thank you so much for being here, Tristika. Thank you. So I can honestly say I have never been incarcerated and so I think a lot of viewers are asking themselves what that experience is like and we really want to hear from you some of the challenges that you had and some of the things that you really feel are things we need to be aware of because they are things that need to be changed I want to hear about the things that were really the most problematic for you while you were incarcerated uh, well um, the problem of First of all, you know, men, it could happen designed, to anybody. It could. And prisons are originally designed for men, so maybe we start there. Right. They're male, when people talk about mass incarceration, what they're talking about is men in prison. That's right. So the whole system was set up. So I was saying earlier that in 1970, that 73% of counties said they had zero women in jail. Zero. Right. Right? Now that is increased so that half the, the population of women are in small county jails. So in that time, the jail didn't necessarily change. Who's in the jail has changed. So what has that been like? Well, it, it's um, predominantly male, you know, catered to males, the jails are. Um, the different programs in the jails are, you know, built around, they're catered to the men, say like the work release and the work programs they, um, the men get the better jobs, uh, men are... Just like on the outside, actually, so well, that's not it's different. Man's, it's so a man's it's world. a man's world, right. And even, even in, when you're incarcerated, it's still a man's world. So the men, you know, they get better pay. Um, you know, women can't have jobs if men from other programs work there. Um, it's almost like women can't be trusted. You know, women are definitely on the very low totem bottom of the pole, you know, when you're incarcerated. I mean, you're already dehumanized when you're incarcerated, but you're even, it's even worse when you're a woman. You know, people, it's, it's like when you're incarcerated, you're looked down upon. When, when you're a man, sometimes people think, oh, well, they're men, you know. Oh, you boy, gotta like, bo like boys, boys would be boys, boys would be, be boys. boys, right? Like that. But a woman, shame on you, right? Like how dare you how get dare yourself you? into this situation? That's right. So it, it's tough, and also women. Um, a lot of times, you know, not only women attack women. You know, um, women are referred to as bitchy. They're referred to as dramatic. I've heard you know, several references to, I'd rather work with prisons full of men than, you know, a small room full of women because they're backstabbing, they're vindictive, you know, and it's just, an, it's an idea that women are so difficult to work with. And so a lot of the, I'm assuming that a lot of the prison guards are, are male. A lot of the people who run the prisons and jails, a lot of them are, are men. Um, as far as the programs that, that you um, have access to, proportionally, how many of them are run by men versus women? I mean, are there women in the prisons trying to deliver services to women? There are some women, but you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, there's women lieutenants. Yeah. Uh, but they're not going to go against right. Like there's a they're not going to go against the grain. So there's an institution. So sure. a lot of so I'm I'm assuming and and again, there are certain things outside of prison that is institutionalized male. That's right. Dominance. That's right. So I'm assuming that probably it can't be all that different the same in this thing particular going on inside. Right. And also you got to realize that inside of prisons and jails, 
there's a lot of secrets. I mean, there's a lot of control that you can't just walk, you, you know, people's loved ones, people's families. Nobody can just walk in and see what's going on. So people are treated, you know, people treat you any way they want to treat you, you know? Right. There's a lot of things going on that are not right. There's a, there's a lot of rules that aren't followed. You know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, it's a closed system. So yes. one would imagine that if a prisoner even complained, you'd have to decide whether or not they were going to believe the officer That's right. or believe the prisoner. Exactly. So most people, all they know about women incarcerated is the show Orange is the New Black. That is like, it's kind of like, oh, well, I've seen that show. Tell us how different it is from what people think it is based on a television show. Um, it's, there's no glamour in it. Right. Absolutely none. It's very, um, very lonely. I mean, there's, you know, there's relationships, you know, when you're incarcerated, but there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of loneliness. Um, you're away from the people that, you know, love you and that you love. And um, I, I, I read that book. And, I read that book, and too. And I've seen the show. And um, it, it, I don't think it touches the surface. Right. Not at all. And it probably varies, I would assume, from one facility to another. Because one of the things we were talking Absolutely. about with jails versus prisons. So prisons are state run. Jails are run by the local municipality. So right. you could be in jail in Fairfax, Arlington, and Alexandria. Mm -hmm. It would be different from being in jail in Richmond or Petersburg sure. or Roanoke. Because it's funded differently, That's number right. one. Mm -hmm. So resources are going to be different. So mm -hmm. women's experience is going to vary somewhat depending on where they're incarcerated. That's right. sure. So talk about the family network. How is it for people who actually have a family that can put money into their account, who actually come to visit them, somebody they can call on the phone? I mean, how is that different from the women who arrive literally with nothing, including a, a support network? Um, well, you have, you, you, it's called a person being indigent has nothing. Um, so you have your haves and you have your have-nots. Uh, and that, that's a big deal when you're incarcerated because really that's all you have to depend on is commissary, you know, and you know, your, your personals, you know, your hygiene products and what you can buy to eat and you know, clothes and stuff. And of course, jail is different than prison. Um, you you get you have more things in prison but it but it's the same with the money and you know it's it's hard to survive and it, it's like a i don't know how to describe it but it's it's a very un in prison a lot of times you can get a job right. you can make 25 cent you can make 35 cent 45 cent uh, and so you can buy your soap, you can buy noodles to eat um, besides what they feed you, your three meals a day. In jails, you, you don't have anything, so you suffer. And uh, there's some people in there that has do, doesn't have anything. It's like Lord of the Flies <laughs> kind of living in there. It's like something that you couldn't imagine unless you're there. Right, so things, listening to the women talk to the reporter, uh, Michael Allison Chandler, who came to, she's writing an article, and I was hearing some of the stories which are pretty unbelievable to people who've never been incarcerated about what you don't have. Allocations of things like toilet paper, um, things like feminine hygiene products, which you don't necessarily get enough of or when you need them. Underwear. Underwear, right? So you get, you're in a jumpsuit and you don't mm -hmm. have underwear, right. and you don't have access to feminine hygiene products when you need them, mm -hmm. and this is considered normal. Yes. Which is pretty amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been told to put a pair of shorts on and put a pad in the shorts. This is amazing, and everything costs money. Mm -hmm. So they were talking about having to buy underwear, and what would be the cost? I mean, some of the costs to me are outrageous for, for what the, and phone calls are, are a whole separate issue, what it costs to make a phone call. I mean, clearly people are making a profit on Absolutely. some of these enterprises. It's big business. Incarceration. Well, incarceration is big business. So it makes sense that the industries that support mass incarceration are mass businesses. That's right. It's gonna be hard to turn this around because 
It's so much money involved in it now. And the, uh, the telephone calls were so expensive, they actually had to go to court and fight against it and have them lowered. And they did uh, recently have them lowered um, in the jails and the prisons. Um, now, GTL and a couple other companies took them back to court because they were still trying to fight and say, hey, you know, we weren't making so much money here. You know, it's not fair. Uh, so what happened is uh, Donald Trump, uh, he appointed a, one of his appointees to the Federal Communications Commission. Um, he appointed this guy and this guy is not fighting for this, this. Right, so it's more important that we have free enterprise, capitalism, That's everybody right. get a chance to make a dollar, That's even right. if you've got, it's not a free enterprise when it's a closed system and prisoners don't have any other option except using that phone system. Yeah. So who's, so I guess the big question here too is, so who is advocating for the prisoners? I mean, who is fighting for more humane treatment, who is fighting for more resources, who is fighting for better oversight. One of the statistics, and there's amazing statistics, that women make up 13 percent of the incarcer incarcerated population, but they file 67 percent of staff on inmate crime reports. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? 13 mm -hmm. percent, but 67 percent of guards mm -hmm. victimizing inmates, mm -hmm. and why is that not a problem? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm as stunned as anybody mm -hmm. is. But listening to the stories of women talk about, you know, being stripped of your basic human dignity, I think is something that people don't understand. I think um, people are not understanding the people who are making, you know, a profit off what's sold to the inmates, things That's like right. phone calls to the inmates, and also how the accounts work. So indigent people really are on the lowest totem pole. That's right. Correct. And have nothing. Bob Barker, big business. Somebody said that he makes the sanitary pads, right? Bob Barker? Oh, the, sh um, the jumpsuits, the shoes, everything's Bob Barker. Um, it's not Bob Barker. Like uh, the game show no. host? Different Bob Barker. Yeah. Well, that's good to know, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but it's uh, a big business. And um, several it like I said it, it would be almost impossible to turn it around it's it's so much money being made well I appreciate you being here to self-advocate because I think one of the wonderful things about the friends of guest house program is the fact that you all are out here in the community helping the rest of us to understand what your experience has been thank you please for join me. us thank you for being here please join us after the break we are going to talk to another resident of the program and we're going to learn more for you. There's free food right there, junk food. You see that truck? Oh, geez. It's a two Michelin star chef. All for free, ladies and gentlemen. All for free. Here we have a panzanella with summer vegetables and pesto. Enjoy. Okay. How we doing? So what do you got going on underneath that plate there? This food is really about to be thrown away. Yeah. Really? Is there, is there something wrong with this food? Where did you get it from? From farmer's markets. They put aside the ugly vegetables and the ugly fruits. Carrot top, soft avocados. It was all food that was going to be discarded. Even the drink you had is made from like a little bruised peach. Did it taste a little bruised? It's good. The average person throws away 24 pounds of food a month. That's a lot. Isn't that a lot? Go visit savethefood.com for more information. Thank you. Junk food time.
Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and tonight we are talking about women behind bars. And we are talking to women who have served time behind bars and are now in the residential program through Friends of Guest House as they work their way back to finding a place in our local community. Joining me in this seg segment is Kimberly Royston. Thank you so much for joining me, Kimberly. Thank you for having me. So we were talking earlier to Tristika, and it's, um, it's an amazing thing to experience this for those of us who never have. And so I would say that a lot of stories of what happens in prison does not get out to other people who might be able to affect change in those programs because these things are not experiences anyone should be having. And I know that you had talked about some of the medical issues that you had while you were incarcerated. And that, you, that by the way, is shared by a huge percentage of women who enter jails and prisons who have health problems. Some of them enter who are pregnant, some of them enter who are just given birth. But these are, they're not necessarily, women are not necessarily given appropriate medical care. And so tell me a little bit about your experience. Um, I went in, I was incarcerated back in February this year and when I was incarcerated, when I was arrested, I came into the jail with paperwork from my physician stating that I was about five and a half, six weeks pregnant. And when I came in, you know, they put my paperwork in my property and I told the nurse, I said, you know, I'm pregnant, I'm going to be sick and withdrawing. She said, no, she's, she's lying, she's not pregnant. And they just, she just dismissed it. And the next day when another nurse came on the shift, they, you know, a day and a half later, they finally gave me a urine test, stated, you know, realizing I was pregnant. And then, you know, the next day, they, I ended up started bleeding because I was going through withdrawals. They didn't do anything. They didn't, you know, so I had to do an emergency room. Found out that I was starting to miscarry. And then the day after I was already starting to miscarry, they decided then that they would take me to the methadone clinic because I guess by state law they're required to take you to the methadone clinic if you're detoxing and you're pregnant. But they waited till the third day and to even take me to the methadone clinic after I went to the emergency room and. You know, my baby's heart rate had already dropped to 65 BPM, and I was already in the process of miscarrying. So. You know, so that is just incredible. And for the other women that you served with, I mean, is this equally difficult for women to get necessary medical treatment? I feel like it is. I feel like when we come in from the streets as an addict, you know, they, they look down on us, which, you know, we, we know the mistakes we're making. You know, we know the problems we have, but, you know, we need help. And, you know, there, yeah, I wasn't the only girl. You know, there was another girl in there that had the same problem. There was another girl that was, that came in and she was like seven months pregnant and she delivered early. Her baby was in the hospital for almost two months. I mean, it's just crazy that they, they let people go into withdrawals, you know, hit full withdrawals and start detoxing before they take us to the clinic to where people start going in to contractions and labor or, and have their babies early or miscarry. I mean, it's just crazy the neglect they have towards us, you know, when we're well, incarcerated. The, the current Surgeon General has said that he believes that, you know, addiction is in fact a public health crisis and not something that the criminal justice system is suited to handle. And I think a lot of what we're seeing as far as how people with addiction issues are treated in jails and prisons are not as they would be in a rehabilitation facility that's geared toward the medical concerns of somebody within withdrawal. We're basically just treating, you know, you, it could have been a parole violation. I'm sure you were incarcerated with a lot of women who were there for different reasons, yes. but everyone's treated the same, even though what they're in for is very different. And so addiction clearly is something that's being treated as a crime and people are being treated as criminals first and not as people with a health problem. Yeah, I feel like a lot of that comes from like, I, I came from Prince William County, ADC, Manassas, and I feel like a lot of it comes from, like they don't have very many programs. There's almost no programs in Prince William County except for the HIDA program through CSB. There's really no options or funding for anything. And you know, when I found out I was pregnant, I went to my probation officer and asked for help, and the only thing that she could have offered me was the HIDA program. When I asked her for help, I ended, she, I was in my appointment at my probation office, you know, because I always showed up my appointments, and she had the police come in and arrest me. When I asked for help for drug treatment, I was arrested and thrown in jail, where I, 
ended up miscarrying because I didn't get the medical attention that I needed when I asked for help. There's that no programs. Crazy. That is really crazy. I mean, you know, there's just no resources in Prince William County. There's nothing. They'd rather throw people in jail instead of, you know, spend the money to get us the medical attention and the help that we actually need. So what you were actually put in jail for was, was what? A probation violation. A probation violation. And so this is what we're finding, that most women who end up incarcerated are incarcerated for these nonviolent, very low-level sorts of things like a parole violation. Why that is, you know, uh, uh, requires incarceration, again, I'm not sure. I, I, yeah, I was thrown in for a violation for relapsing and asking for help. So tell me, when you applied for this program, what was that process like when you actually heard about Friends of Guest House, how you applied, what the process was to get into this program? Um, actually, strange enough, my probation officer was the one that sent the paperwork to my lawyer, and she was the one that recommended it because the insurance I have through the state, you know, would only cover partial, you know, inpatient, you know, wouldn't satisfy what the judge wanted for me. So my probation officer recommended it and my lawyer brought me the paperwork and I filled it out and mailed it in. And then from there, the jail therapist at the jail, she helped me to get in, you know, do the phone interview and, you know, do the process to get into the guest house. So how long were you incarcerated? So you were in once and then you were in twice? I've been in, I've been in and out yeah. uh, five times within three years in Prince William County. So do, you, so do you, so five, five times in and out, and so do you really feel like this is your chance to get back where you need to be with the support that you need? I do. I mean, I feel like it's a really good program. I mean, just like hearing about all the things Guest House offers and everything, I mean, I've never, every time I've been incarcerated before, I never had like actual release date. I never went through no reentry programs. I just went to court, got time served, and was just thrown back out on the streets, back to nothing. You know, no kind of treatment, nothing to help me. Just throw them back out, you're on probation. And then I get a violation and they'd send me right back. See, this is what Laura and I were talking about. You know, and, and they, they serve so few people out of the hundreds of women who need some kind of support. Otherwise, that's exactly what you're left with. You're left with nothing except going back to the life you had before, the, before you were incarcerated, which makes no sense. No. So um, tell me a little bit about now that you're in the guest, uh, Friends of Guest House program, you know, what are some of the goals that you have for yourself moving forward? Um, I, I, need, I would like to establish a stable job. I mean, I haven't really had a stable job in nine years since, you know, my last child was born. And, you know, I hope that I can get back into a job and get my life together and, you know, be a better role model to my children. You and know. so how many children do you have? I have two children. And is it, you know, and are you working to reconnect with them? Yeah, I mean, I have a pretty good relationship with my uh, son's father, and I talk to him. Um, my daughter, her dad, it's not, it's not a really good Involved. situation. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I think, that's, I think that's terrific. I think having goals is one of the ways that you can stay focused on the path to get you back where you need to go. I'm also interested in the fact that Friends of Guest House really work with women like you and the other women on this show to talk about their experiences and to be advocates for change inside the jail and prison system. Yeah, I mean, it, they had the ACLU come by the house and talk to us, you know, I mean, I think it was a great opportunity because I think people need to hear about what goes on in the jails. I mean, they try to keep it under wraps. Like, you know, I was trying to get into the drug dorm program and Prince William County, it's mostly a men's jail. Right. Like all we jails. We talked about that. Yeah, yes. I mean, Prince William County facilitates at max like 100, 120 women tops. So the drug dorm only holds 10 girls, 10 females at a time. So there's always a long waiting list. It's hard to get in. Well, I was trying to get into the program because the judge told me that he'd give me a reconsideration if I could get into the drug dorm program. Because I made a statement to one of the nurses saying, I should sue you guys for making me miscarry, for not giving me the medical treatment I needed. They put um, an incident report in the computer system against me, which kept me from getting into the drug dorm program, getting the help that I needed. That's incredible. So it's very political, which I caught a little bit of that from Tristika, that it's very political as to who has and who has not, and who has leverage and who has not, and how people are chosen or not. So making one remark can get you barred from the program that would have gotten you a consideration, a reconsideration from the judge. Yeah, just making one remark like that. And you know, I'd, I've never even been in trouble in jail. I've never had any incident reports prior, no write-ups in any of the 
five times I'd been in and out of jail, you know. I never got in trouble with any of the officers or anything, but just making that one comment made it to where I was blocked from getting treatment inside the jail. So, you know, moving forward, I'm sure you have terrific concerns for your relationship with your son and daughter as far as trying to prevent them from ending up in the same cycle. You know, the, the women that you were incarcerated with, were a lot of them sort of in the same situation of being on this in and out cycle? I mean, help me understand who's in there. The, a lot, of, honestly, yeah, I've, I mean, I've been in and out of the system since 2014, from the first time I was incarcerated in 2014, and there's a good six, seven girls that, that every single time I end up in there, every year, I'm in there with the same women, every year, and they're in and out, just like me, in and out. And unfortunately, you know, this last time, Two of them that came that were in there with me that have been in, in there with me the last three years prior. Two of them had got got released, and within two to three weeks, both of them have already overdosed and died because they were just thrown right back out in the streets with no treatment. Wow, overdose deaths. I mean, we see more and more of that, and some of that's bad drugs out on the street. But that is that is a sad end to somebody's life. Yeah. And the amount of money too that is spent on constantly you know, paying to incarcerate people instead of putting the same amount of money into treatment programs or rehabilitation programs and community-based programs blows my mind that we don't see how we're throwing money away on something that clearly doesn't work. So you've made the commitment that you're not going back, no, right? I don't want to go back. <laughs> and, so, a plan. and so you are working on getting a job and as far as getting the job, what is your biggest hurdle there besides the fact that you have a record, which is everybody's biggest problem? Yeah, that's that's probably definitely number one is my record, but I mean, the guest house is a really good program and they seem to have a lot of resources, as does Alexandria, way more resources than Prince William County and, you know, because of, you know, how many people know about the guest house program and, you know, they're pretty well known. A lot of people help, you know, with jobs and stuff. They help the girls in the program. They know you know, when we come in and say we're from Guest House, they want to help. So. You know, I know they're looking for more and more workforce partners, people who are like, we're willing to give people an opportunity. And so I hope that you are at the top of the list for getting one of those jobs with one of their partners, because I do think steady employment is the key to building your life back from where it was. And, you know, I'm so sorry for the loss of your, of your baby, which I... I don't even know what to say about that, but I'm Thank so you. sorry for your experience, but I think together we can help shed some light. And that's what I want to tell all of our viewers. You know, join us for the last segment. We're going to talk a little bit more about what women's experience in prison and jail is and how they are trying to rebuild their lives as they come back into our community through programs like Friends of Guest House. So please join us after the break. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there. What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs? Just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? I can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. We, we just, just finished, finished dinner, dinner and, and it was time, time for homework. homework. He hates, hates homework. homework. I know he's bright. Why is it so hard for me? He's I'm just trying got to as try hard a little as harder. I can. One in five children struggle with learning and attention issues. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. It's me, Artie. Come see what I collected from the Creative Galaxy in my idea box. Transform your world. Will you help me make art? Each one of our keeps us Before you throw it away. Hey, I have an idea. Think outside. The box. We'll never get older. Each one Go be amazing. Give your cardboard box another life. Recycle. Most party fouls? <laughs> Not a big deal. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving. The ultimate party foul. 
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the final segment of Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we are talking about women behind bars, the experience of women who are incarcerated and come out through programs like the Friends of Guest House trying to rebuild their lives and reintegrate into our community. Here in our last segment is Alexis Lax, who we had a little conversation about the fact that if you're familiar with the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, she is part of the Lacks family. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So some of the stories that I he heard from people who were at Guest House about some of the simple things trying to manage your daily routine were just so difficult. You know, things like having to have money in your account, what you had to pay for things, rationing of toilet paper, rationing of feminine hygiene products, the trading back and forth between people who had things with people who didn't have things. You know, um, our first guest said, uh, Tristika said it was kind of Lord of the Flies like. Tell us a little bit about your experience and how you managed that day to day life. Um, well, um, actually, I had to plot when I first went into Fairfax. I had to plot and say that I was on my cycle so that I can get a pair of underwear because they don't supply you with underwear when you first go in. So I had to actually, you know, to get a pair of underwear because I didn't know where my canteen was going to come from. I had to basically, you know, tell them that I was on my cycle and to get a pair of underwear. So I, for my whole 50 days, I had to go with hand washing and they don't allow you to keep your, your underclothes in the room. So if you try to hand wash them other than the days you wash, then you'd be wearing the same underwear, you know, every day. Which doesn't sound particularly hygienic at all. Not at all. No. You know, and, and, I, and I heard from some of the other women too that things like you're, you're given a certain amount of toilet paper, and again, when you're on your cycle, you don't necessarily, you, you, different times you need more of that, but that's not something you have the option of getting more of unless you buy it. Correct? I mean, you have, you have to have money in your account in order to buy some of these things that most of us would assume is provided by the jail. Well, actually, with the toilet paper situation, what I do is if I see myself, like, down to the last sheets of toilet paper, and, you know, so what I would do is, because you can have one roll of toilet paper in your room, I would just, you know, take the, the rest of the toilet paper out and then stick it in the middle of the toilet paper that I go get. So, because in the middle of the night, they don't, the deputies don't like you to yell out your window so you're not able to ask for any toilet paper. So all night you will be without toilet paper. So I would just, you know, get a roll and then try to get the other roll out of the room so that I won't get written up to ha for having more than one roll of tissue. You know, and that to me is kind of amazing that, you know, you would get written up for having, I mean, some, some of the things that I heard about things like having, like you said, strategizing how you have to cope because there are rules and you will get written up. Um, one young woman told me that in order to get Tylenol for cramps, you, you could call and ask for Tylenol for, you know, a headache or no, a toothache, a toothache, because they'll give you Tylenol for a toothache, but not for cramps. I mean, I don't understand the point of some of these rules and regulations. I mean, I'm not a professional inside that industry, but it seems to me that there is a lot of that. There's just every day, it's layer on layer of trying to figure out how to cope and manage with not enough resources. Well, yeah, they will give you um, Tylenol one time, and then if you need Tylenol more than that one time, if you're cramping all day, you know, eventually right. the Tylenol will wear off. And if you, you're cramping and you're cramping for a long time, they'll make you write a sick call, so you have to wait a whole day. By the time the day is over right. with, then you've been done, you know, right. you won't be cramping anymore because it's only the first day that you go through the right. experience of doing a lot of cramping. Right. So it seems like, you know, again, we were talking earlier with Kimberly about the fact that as far as medical care, or medical treatment, it's kind of difficult to get something as simple as Tylenol, you know, just for something like regular menstrual cramps. And the other thing is getting the products themselves, which are also distributed based on what? How do they distribute them? The tunnel? Well, no, like like pads, because I think tampons you have to buy is what I oh, understood. Oh, in Fairfax, in Fairfax they have a bin with pads, but you can only take, but 
a couple in your room. Like you can get like a pack, which you got probably like six to eight in a pack. Mm -hmm. But you have to use about four of them on at one time right, so that you won't, you know, especially know. with me having one pair of panties, I have to put almost a whole pack of pads on right. at one time. Right. And so, so some of the stuff just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me about how they are kind of hoarding needed supplies for women who are incarcerated. Like managing your monthly cycle is not something that's optional. It's also so something that men don't have to deal with at all. So again, we talked about the fact that, you know, prisons and jails were originally designed really to meet the needs of men. And they were not really designed to meet the needs of women. And this is one of those areas where I think, you know, I think people more and more are shocked about the fact that basic needs like that are not being met. In Michigan, the ACU, ACLU has a, has a lawsuit against the, the state of Michigan, which has not been resolved, you know, to provide these basic necessary things. But I'm assuming that this probably varies from one jail and one prison to another, so that everybody has different policies. Yeah, well, Fairfax, the men actually get to walk around by themselves. They don't have to have a guard walking around with them. They just walk up and down the hallway as pleased. And with us, if we see the, a man coming down while we walking down with a guard, we have to stay walking down with our face straight and the man just walk down the, down the hall like it ain't nothing. I don't even understand the point of that. I, I mean, I just don't understand the point of that. Why you would treat one gender one way and women a another way walking down the hall. I mean, do you have any insight about that? Like, why? <laughs> I wish I did so I can would try to say something about it, but no, I just, I really didn't understand it. Because even when females is on trustee, a guard still have to, you know, because trustee is work release right. of the jail, and they still have to, you know, walk through the hall with um, with a guard, when they going back and forth, they have to sit and wait for a guard to come. But if it was a male, they press the button and they go walking around in the hall by themselves. Well, I think one of the most disturbing statistics, and I think I mentioned it before, is that women women make up 13 percent of the incarcerated population, but they file 67 percent of the reports about guard on prisoner crimes, and so. Perhaps that's a safeguard to make sure that somehow women are safer, except you're being guarded by the people who 67% of the time are kind of the source of the assault. So I'm not sure about that either in my own mind. I just think it's, you know, most people, like I said previously, people watch the show, Orange is the New Black. They think <laughs> they understand what being incarcerated is. I don't think that that's what being incarcerated is, and I think the experience really varies by one woman to another. Um, one of the women, uh, the two of the women at uh, Friends of Guest House were showing us how they make um, tampons out of pads. I don't know if you've seen that done, but they basically take these cheap pads and roll them up and, and make, and I'm, and I'm asking myself, why are they having to do that? You know, and again, does uh, some of that access to um, common, commonly needed items come down to having money in your account? Is that really what defines what you're able to buy or have access to beyond what you get? Well, the boxes of tampons is very, very expensive. So I guess if somebody don't have the money, they would just make them make them of tampons instead of buying, because you can't, you have to buy a whole box. So if the person ain't got no money there, I guess they'd rather make it. But I, you know, I they don't sell Q-tips. So I used to make me Q-tips because one time when I was showering, my water went in my ear and yeah. I couldn't hear out of my ear and I couldn't get down to the um, doctor. So um, I just started making Q-tips, but when, I, when they caught me, I got written up not to be able to take but so many pads in my room. So you make a needed Q-tip, you get written up, and then you get punished for it. I mean, some of this just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me on the outside. The other thing too, as far as, again, I think with the underwear, isn't that something else that you have to purchase? Yes, and they are, they are expensive for one pair. Like yes. I said, especially when you're trying to order everything, especially a thermal, because it's like, even in the winter time, it's like winter. So you basically, you know, you're trying to order a thermal, and then you're trying to get your underclothes, your socks, and everything that you need as far as the hygiene, you know. You, you're, you are not gonna be able to buy so much, especially if you get a one-time, somebody sending you something on commissary. 
So to explain a little bit about how that works as far as somebody sending you something on commissary, you know, for how kind of walk us through that. So there are things that are available for you to purchase, but people can't bring you things. In other words, you have to purchase them on site. So people have to give you money. They can't just bring you something. Well, in Alexandria, it, it, Dana, you don't have to pay, but I know at Fairfax, you have to pay $2 a day. So if you was in there for about almost a month and somebody finally sent you something, they would have to send you what they're going to send you plus an extra like 30 something $40 because you have to pay $2 a day. So that's just something that's charged to every prisoner is $2 a day. So if you're in there for 30 days, that's $60. Yes. Right. So you need sixty dollars, and so that that money goes to the jail first before any money can be used to purchase anything, like a box of tampons. Right. Wow. Okay. See, I, I don't think most of us really understand how this works, and so it's it's something I want our viewers to understand is what it's like to try to cope when you're inside different situations. Tell us a little bit about your family. You said you had. Um, a child? I have two kids. I have a 16-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. Um, the most, the, my daughter understands a little bit, um, but my son, he don't really understand. So it was very hard for me to have to try to talk to him and basically like tell him mommy's not in a situation to be able to, to you know, come stay the night with you. So then he's crying, he's starting to, he, he has started acting up in school more. And um, he was just, you know, started lashing out. Right, well, I, you know, 2.6 million children apparently have a parent incarcerated in this country. And 2.6 million children is a lot of kids to, to be concerned about how they're gonna grow up perceiving what happened to their parents. And so it's great that you have a good relationship with your daughter and now that you are back and in this program at Guest House. It's even uh, better. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, so now you have an opportunity to reconnect with your six-year-old. And so how does he feel about that, knowing that there are times now that he can see you? Oh, he's very happy about it. Um, actually, I'm going to be uh, going to stay with him tonight because we have to go to an appointment. And, and that's you know, another good thing about the program. You know, you're, ever, you're able to interact with your family. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to be able to see him. So you're going to see your happy. son tonight. Well, that's something to make <laughs> you smile. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate your, you sharing your story with us. I really do, because all of you have been so wonderful tonight helping us to understand what you have been through. And I hope people will take an interest in Friends of Guest House and what this program is trying to do to help the literally hundreds of women need this program and they've got 26 beds. So please go to their website, friendsofguesthouse.org. 